Welcome to the Web of Faith. I'm Father John Tregilio of the Diocese of Harrisburg and President of the Confraternity Catholic Clergy. I'm joined by my classmate and colleague, Father Ken Brigenti of the Diocese of Metuchen, New Jersey, and also Vice Rector of Mount St. Mary's Seminary in Emmitsburg, Maryland. Welcome, Father Ken. Thank you. And we're going to answer questions posted by you, our viewers and listeners, from weboffaith at EWTN.com. And Father Ken, let's see what we have today. Hey, dear Father Tregilio, can you explain the significance of the various colors that priests wear at Mass? Thank you, Henry. Well, Henry, um, the colors that uh, the priests wear um, signify different things, and they're are two parts of the church, the East and the West, and I can only answer for uh, ourselves in the Western or Latin church, because in the Eastern church, their color uh, signification is, is different. Um, in the Latin church, uh, green is the most common uh, color you'll see, and it's used at what we call ordinary time. That's usually outside of the, the feast days and penitential seasons. Uh, the next color you see most often is the color purple or violet. And that's used in Advent and Lent, which are preparatory times, uh, penitential times. So Advent is just before Christmas and Lent is just before Easter. The next most uh, um, predominant uh, color is the color white. And we use that for big uh, holy feast days like Christmas and Easter, uh, other feast of the Virgin Mary, uh, any feast that is not involving someone who uh, was a martyr because then the color red would be worn because they died, uh, they shed their, their blood in a sense for the faith. Um, but, or the Holy Spirit is another, uh, because of the fire of, of, over the apostles at Pentecost would be another time that red would be worn. But uh, the Feast of the Holy Trinity, uh, the Feast of um, the Corpus Christi, the Body and Blood of Christ, that would be white. Sometimes gold could be worn at Christmas and Easter and these other feast days to add a little extra solemnity. Most of the saints who were not martyrs, uh, if it's a big, uh, besides an optional memorial, you would see uh, white vestments. Um, black can be worn at funerals and also on the Feast of All Souls Day, or you can wear a purple or violet uh, for those days. Um, each color is determined uh, in the, what is called an ordo, which the diocese uh, puts out for each diocese, lets you know what the color is for that particular holy day or feast day, and many times it's up to the priest if there's an option, if he wants to celebrate um, the ferial, which is the, the continuing uh, ordinary, or the, time. ordinary time, uh, the Lexio Continua would be the, the scripture readings that would continue in that same pattern as the day before it. One color that is not given permission by Rome, but has been creeping in uh, in different parishes, especially during the Advent season, is a blue vestment, mm. uh, and they call it Sarum Blue, which is supposed to be uh, a, a vestment that was worn in uh, ancient um, times in England up until the uh, Reformation. Uh, but this is not a liturgically approved color, and um, p priests should not be wearing blue. Um, they should be wearing purple. Now, in Rome, they, they have a distinction of different colors of purple. They have a more <laughs> reddish purple, uh, they call that a Roman purple, Roman purple, what they wear during the Advent season, and then in during Lent, it's a darker purple. Um, but that's just a distinction. You don't have to do that as long as it's purple. purple. It could be purple, dark purple if you want for Advent. But blue, navy blue, should not be worn for the Blessed Mother, or it should not be worn in the Advent season. Yeah. Okay. Now you can have a little blue coloring in, on the white, on the white, but the predominant right. color must be white. white right. uh, orange is out, okay. Um, I never seen yellow. Orange, but that must be really um, good. <laughs> <laughs> and green. Uh, I, I see people try to wear green on St. Pat Patrick's Day. Um, St. Patrick is a, a feast day, so the proper color is white particularly if he's the, he's the patron saint of that diocese. But I know a lot of people say, well, yeah, but Father, it's the wearing of the green. But normally it falls during uh, Lent, so it would be purple, unless it's a it's, patronal feast. Or, is the, I'm talking about yeah. where it's the, the principal feast right. uh, in the diocese. We also have to mention there is two Sundays of the year where rose may be worn, Gaudete Sunday, which is the third Sunday of Advent, and Laetari Sunday, which is the fourth Sunday of Lent, of, of Lent and the third Sunday of Advent. And it's important to know that it's not pink. Not pink. It's rose. Real priests <laughs> do not wear pink. Right. 
or Pepto-Bismol color. <laughs> it, it is rose color. Yes. And the uh, reason why is because in uh, it signifies that the season is half uh, concluded your preparation either for Christmas, for Advent, or for um, uh, e Easter in uh, Latari Sunday. Yes. Um, uh, I think people really they, they identify or expect it because when there's Advent, there's the 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 the, the uh, rose uh, Advent candle, and so they know the priest is going to sort of sort of match that. Um, one other just little incidental thing to mention is that the chalice veil and burst often match the priest's vestment. And the deacon's stole and dalmatic will match what the priest is wearing. Uh, sometimes, uh, if they do not have a matching set, a uh, white uh, chalice veil can always be used. And when I was pastor, I even had the tabernacle veil uh, to you match. You had everything coordinated, yes. Father, everything, <laughs> including your socks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, let's see here. Dear Father Burgundy, how can Catholics call Mary, quote, bright morning star when this title is given to Jesus in the end of Revelation? Also, Mary is called, quote, advocate in the Hail Holy Queen, a title given to Christ in 1 John. How do you explain this title sharing or swapping? Sincerely, Lenore. Well, Lenore, it's really not sharing or swapping because you're talking about different titles and, um, and not a theological definitions here. So uh, sometimes we consider Mary uh, the morning star or we even call her the dawn and Christ uh, the day. Um, uh, Morning star referring to just before the dawn, and then of course Christ the day, the sun, mm -hmm. uh, the fullness of light. Uh, advocate, uh, you know, uh, saints uh, intercede. Uh, they uh, they could consider ourselves bringing our cause, being our case, being our advocate. It, we're not saying that Mary is the advocate. Of course, that's mm -hmm. our blessed Savior Jesus Christ, uh, who is the uh, advocate to the Father. Uh, but we're saying that she is an inter uh, intercessor, as the other saints. Uh, our intercessors for us as well. Um, so not to really, I mean, there's a beautiful uh, books of litanies uh, and Mary, uh, there's a called the Litany of Our Lady of Loretto. And there are many, many different titles uh, in the litany that we give to Mary uh, that, um, uh, that you can meditate and, and, and pray on, as well as Christ has many, many different titles mm -hmm. under the litany of the Sacred Heart or the litany of the uh, Precious Blood or the litany of the Holy Name of Jesus. Uh, all these litanies have different titles of our Yes, and those Savior. titles are not exclusive. That's what right. is important for people to realize is that some of them may only be used just because out of, of uh, usage, but we're talking about adjectives that are not exclusively proper to one person. Uh, we're talking about allegories and, and uh, metaphors. Uh, even Jesus says at one point, you know, I am the light of the world. And then at another point he says, you are the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. Well, if he's the light of the world, how can we be the light of the world? It's a figure of speech. And that's what you have to always, again, we go to the context you know, we always go to the context to understand properly what the text means, see where it's fitting in. Is this a figure of speech? And so a lot of these titles are not theological definitions, whereas some Jesus, of them are some of them are actually poetry yes. that were written like St. Bernard of Clairvaux wrote beautiful prayers on the Blessed Mother or that were very poetic. Uh, and uh, so you have a, a, um, a different genre mm -hmm. uh, and the poetry or songs of that nature uh, evoke or to raise the spirit in, in prayer. Uh, then you have theological definitions mm -hmm. or, or in dogma and doctrine. Uh, that's for clarity and, and truth. Uh, so poetry, you have to see that this, that exactly. a lot of these things are written in that genre. Something very specific like Mary's title is Mother of God, Theotokos. That's, that's a theology. Deep, deep, that was defined, Council Ephesus, right. that's a particular phrase. You know, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of Man, that's a theological title. But then when you're getting into these more poetic, uh, metaphorical, allegorical usages, don't get bummed out because, you know, it, it's just a figure of speech that can be appropriated in different circumstances. And again, look at the context. All right, Father Ken, let's see what we have here. Okay, this is for you. Dear Father Tregilio, I'm a devout cradle Catholic and look forward to receiving the Eucharist daily. In addition, I try to spend even a half hour with our Lord in Eucharistic adoration once a week or more. If I could be so fortunate, my wife became Catholic when we, when we got married, but now attends a non-denominational church with our children. 
My family is now polarized and I am the odd man out. There is a definite schism. Despite counseling, the rift widens. Although I have ceased to verbally evangelize my children because I am always ignored or chastised as a result. Daily life is miserable at home despite my attempts to offer up these trials as redemptive suffering. Is there any provision in the Catholic faith for situations as these where one's spiritual growth and practices and ability to raise children in the faith becomes impossible? In Christ's love, Anonymous. Ooh, Anonymous, you have our prayers because that's not an easy situation to, um, to live with. I know um, firsthand of, of relatives and friends and some parishioners who are in a similar uh, predicament. Um, when a spouse who has entered the faith now reverts back to their former faith, that's not a, a, an easy uh, proposition uh, because um, there's not much you can do um, except pray for them. But also I think the, the best thing is be consistent in practicing your faith and even though the wife and kids may not be going to Mass with you, if they see that you're still going and if they see that it's making you a better person, if they see that it, you're getting something out of it, you're coming home, you know, maybe not on cloud nine, but you've got something and they're going to want to say, well, you know, what, what's, why is this when dad comes back from Mass, there's a little difference, okay, or he seems happier or um, if, he, if he's not able to go because he's sick or bad weather, there's something different, you know, they, they, could, they sense you're missing something. You're going to lure them into pondering that question. What is it that you have that we are not getting? Well, the, the thing I see, too, from this question is uh, you can teach by example more than words. So just what you were saying, uh, by being authentic, to your Catholic faith, uh, that your faith and mass makes a difference in your life, and then bringing that home and how you treat your wife, how you treat your children, how you treat people in society, speaks about authenticity of your faith, which will speak millions of words mm -hmm. uh, than, uh, than a sermon could. Uh, so to authentically live your life according to Christ uh, is very important. The second thing, I assume by this letter that the kids are older, because if they were younger, uh, you can just gather them and take them with, with them exactly, yourself. Exactly, yeah. So, I'm, that's, I'm, so yeah. At, at one point in your life, uh, uh, you know, when they're older, and uh, it's very hard to uh, persuade uh, uh, them through argumentation or what have you. So again, you can teach by example. But if there's a disconnect, meaning you go to Mass, adoration, and then at home, you're unjust, you're, you're confrontational, uh, um, you're not honest in dealings with other people, and then they see that disconnect. Exactly. Well, that's sending a very bad exactly. message. Exactly, yeah, you wanna be consistent, uh, you wanna bring the, live the faith as well as practice the faith. I think, I, I'm glad you point out this thing about if their children are still minors, if you still have the, the, the authority that you possess as the father of the family, you know, man up and say, you know, look, um, the kids are going with me to mass, you know, if they're over the age of, of majority, they're going to go where they want, they're adults, but, you know, you, you certainly are going to say something where they're going to school. I don't think you're re relinquishing all your authority uh, to your wife. So it's funny how when it comes to religion, sometimes guys step back a little bit and say, well, I'll let the wife get away. Well, look, you, the head of the family has a job and he has to use that authority. And if he doesn't, you know, it, it's, it's a sin of omission. Underlining thing here I see is that marriage counseling is going to be needed because this is just the tip of the iceberg. Exactly. And, um, and I would really suggest marriage counseling and maybe even family counseling at one yeah. point bringing the children in uh, to, to help in this issue. Now, if the wife had never converted, um, I know many families where the husband goes to Mass Saturday night, takes the kids there, then Sunday morning goes with his wife to her Protestant service and gives her support. He doesn't go to communion, obviously, uh, but he supports her. And that, in, in, in many cases, is a help. Uh, but those are in cases where the, the, the wife has never left her former faith and joined Catholicism. 
I, in this case, she reverted back to her former faith. But I also know families who uh, the f husband might be Catholic and the wife might be Protestant, but uh, the, they raised their children Catholic and the wife even became the PTA in the Catholic school uh, to, to help their children. It's amazing, because they yeah. wanted, they believed in the v value of the one faith yeah. in the home, even though she may not have converted, uh, but they believe in the one faith and the one value at home. And that's what I, that's I, what, I you know, it, those people you give great credit to because I know some parishioners who I would see at Mass every weekend, and, and then I, kn I knew that they were not of our faith, but because this was their spouse or their children, they still go even after the spouse has died. Right. And you say, wow, they, you know, that, or like in, your, in case you mentioned, here's somebody going to Mass every week, being on the, on the, on the PTA, the, the, uh, being active member of, of the parish, but not abandoning their own faith, you know, staying true to their, their, their Protestant tradition. That's a great testimony of, of, of their love for their husband and their children. Okay, let's see what else we have here today. Here's one for you, Father Brigenti. Is it superstitious to bury a statue of St. Joseph upside down in your yard when you're trying to sell your house? Thanks, Steve. Steve, yes. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> now, wait a minute. You're not Sicilian, so. Uh, yeah, you know. Yes, it is superstition, and I, I, I'm, you know, I just can't stand when I go into a Catholic bookstore and I see these St. Joseph kits. Uh, which tells you the procedure to bury the statue uh -huh. and then the prayer that it, you save. So, yes, and the statue has to be buried upside down and all this rigmarole. And that really is superstition. What you really should do is the prayer that's important. Now, you can venerate the statue of St. Joseph in your home. Uh, he is the universal patron saint of the church. He is a uh, patron saint of, of uh, the provider uh, of, 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 of income and jobs. Um, and so very uh, beautiful devotion. Um, and you mentioned Sicilians. We have a devotions to St. Joseph in March 19th of blessing the food, uh, uh, bread, and, um, and things of that nature because there was a drought in Sicily and, and they pray to Almighty God through the intercession of St. Joseph uh, uh, and that if they did, if God answered their prayers and, and rain would come, that they would provide a, a table for the poor always. And till this day, the St. Joseph's table is, is uh, honored um, not only in Sicily, but in many places in the United States uh, where Italian parishes have settled and throughout of Italy as well. And, um, and it's not just for families or for friends, but to provide for the poor. So all those are good devotions to St. Joseph. Uh, pray, yes, if you want to sell your home, make a, what we call a novena. A novena means nine days of prayer in honor of a particular saint to, uh, that you're asking for intercession to Almighty God. Uh, that's perfectly fine uh, to do so. But to uh, bury a statue a certain way and to put it upside down and in the bar is really speaks of superstition and should not be done. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the, the idea that the statue itself is going to sell the house is where the, the problem is. And, you know, there, when we were doing research for our uh, Saints for Dummies books, I remember, you know, this practice goes back to a, a brother in Canada who put St. Joseph medals on a piece of property that he want, that the monastery wanted to acquire. And within a few days, it, it happened. But that was an act of piety that was tied into prayer and it wasn't the medals that achieved it, it was the prayer and the faith of the person. So you're right, if people think that the statue has supernatural powers or the direction you point him is going to determine where you're going to move, you know, that, that gets into silliness. Plus, I don't know, if I were that saint, I wouldn't want to be buried in the ground either, you know. So, <laughs> but, you know, that's also to be well. taken into consideration. Oh, I'm sorry, we ran out of time. We're going to be taking a short break. We'll be back in a few moments with more Web of Faith. 